Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction. So the, today, today's talk is uh, uh, going to report about uh, an initiative we run in Mozambique uh, to define the interoperability uh, of the government systems of, uh, of the country. And uh, let me start by, let's say, uh, by, by defining, by uh, sharing the, a definition of interoperability. And by interoperability, we mean the capability of two or more systems to exchange uh, data information and knowledge according to, let's say, the level of details and the level of, let's say, richness of the information you're exchanging. And uh, this capability of exchanging information basically allows you to, let's say, enable uh, efficient and effective services for, uh, by the government for the citizens, uh, to, to, for the businesses, and even to other organizations and, and other governments. Uh, just to get a bit into uh, uh, a bit in more details about okay what interoper interoperability really allows you to achieve. Let me show you an example, uh, which is the picture you see here on the left, which is a scan from my driving license. Actually, I, I've got two surnames: Villa Fiorita Monteleone, and in my driving license, an officer had to write by hand. Uh, the fact that I'm really named Monteleone, the reason being then uh, that when I got my driving license, basically the IT systems then couldn't store my full surname. So the IT system managed only the, let's say, my surname but the last four characters. And, uh, and that was a problem because uh, my identity card, which was uh, managed by a different system, had my first surname. So there I was, uh, let's say, with a document stating that I was named Villa Fiorita Montele, and another document stating that I was named Villa Fiorita Monteleone. Small problem, but let's say, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, it shows very clearly uh, why you, what kind of advantages you have with interoperability. Matter of fact, because of this small problem, I ended up being registered twice in the health system with all the, let's say, the nuisances uh, you may imagine I had to deal over, over, the, over the years. So the, first, uh, so the first advantage of, let's say, being interoperable is being able to, let's say, uniquely reference data and events the government has to manage. But there are other advantages, uh, as I was mentioning, for citizens and uh, businesses alike. So when uh, you don't have uh, interoperability, uh, what usually happens is that the citizen becomes the process integrators. Meaning, by this I mean uh, uh, that, let's say, the citizen has to, let's say, go through all the different steps of the procedures, physically uh, carrying the documents from one office to the next in order to ensure that, let's say, the data which is not exchanged by the system actually is, uh, let's say, uh, runs through, uh, through, through the procedure. And you may imagine the kind of, let's say, uh, time and errors this, this kind of, let's say, uh, approach uh, causes. And if it can be a problem for, for citizens, uh, when you move, let's say, your uh, focus to, to businesses, it becomes even more, more evident. So because, because basically by constraining the businesses to, let's say, perform all, all these procedures by, by hand, the, you're basically uh, uh, having them lose their competitiveness with respect to uh, businesses in other, in other countries. Matter of fact, when we started the, the project in Mozambique, that was quite a few years ago, um, they told us it would take about five to six months to get started with a business. You can imagine, let's say, the kind of, let's say, troubles this would cause to, uh, could cause to the, to the economy. Uh, uh, least but, uh, last but not least, we also need to consider that, let's say, the more complex the procedures are, the less interoperable the systems are, uh, the more opportunities there are uh, for, let's say, corruptions and favoritism. Uh, because uh, if you have procedures taking ages to get sorted out, if you have, let's say, systems which do not communicate, it becomes simpler for, uh, let's say, 
people with bad intention to, to ask money for, let's say, uh, speeding the procedure up a bit, or maybe, let's say, making sure the data is um, exchanged and, let's say, the procedure carried out as, uh, as it should. So, just now tell you a bit about the context in which we develop this interoperability project, namely Mozambique. Um, it is an ex-Portuguese uh, colony. It is independent from uh, 1965, but let's say for the first 20 years, uh, the economy in the country really lingered due to many factors, among which uh, uh, heavy immigration, uh, economic dependence on South Africa, uh, droughts, and, and, and a, a, a very bad civil war, which lasted for, for, for several, uh, several years. And um, so the, the pacification process was uh, um, helped, helped by, by Italy, and more specifically uh, 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 Trentino, the, the, the place where, uh, where I work, the region where I work played a, a significant role in the pacification and the pacification process, and, and this is one of the reasons uh, there is a, such a strong connection between two territories which are uh, apparently so far away from from uh, from each, each other. Uh, in any case, starting from the let's say 90s, the economy in the country grew uh, mainly uh, because of investments, having invest, significant investments from foreign countries, uh, among which uh, more recently China, which is uh, uh, investing a big amount of money in the, for the development of the, of the country. And um, these investments are basically supporting a very fast economical growth, although, although it is uh, uh, a fragile economical growth because uh, um, because basically it is driven by uh, uh, injection of foreign money rather than from, let's say, uh, a strong capability of the country to, let's say, generate internal uh, uh, gross, uh, gross product. Uh, yeah. So, so the, the situation is that of a typical, of a typical developing, uh, developing country. And uh, if you are not used or you are not, uh, let's say, uh, uh, if you don't have experience with, let's say, projects in developing countries, you, you may ask yourself, why, why on earth do, do, do we need uh, IT uh, when there are so many problems to, to be solved? And the point, the point is that uh, Africa is uh, a thriving environment for ICTs, and developing countries can be thriving environment for, uh, for, for uh, ICTs, despite the, the many challenges they, they, may, they may face. IT is different from the one uh, we may be used to in, the, in other territories. For instance, it is mobile first, because mobile um, is uh, so much more widespread than, uh, let's say, um, landline communications. And, um, but but, but the, the, let's say, unique challenges and opportunities uh, developing countries face allow them to, to develop innovative solutions, and also what we call uh, Reverse innovation, namely the fact that um, some 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 solutions uh, have a wider applicability. Solutions, uh, let's say, the uh, thought for uh, usually constrained environment uh, have a wide application, even in, in the environments in which, uh, let's say, the constraints are more more uh, relaxed. And um, another point is that the possibility of, let's say, designing IT systems. From um, let's say from the beginning is also a unique opportunity for uh, let's say uh, building things right, uh, so so to speak. And one example I have in mind in this respect is that of a European country, Estonia, which uh, became uh, independent uh, recently. But the interesting thing is that um, uh, driven and guided by uh, a young uh, political of uh, uh, young politicians. They managed to, let's say, uh, build uh, uh, state-of-the-art government services because they, they managed to, to, to develop them from scratch. 